Hello, and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled MicroRNAs in CSF as Prodomal Biomarkers for Huntington's Disease. My name is Joe Shan Carpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by HTG. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Richard Mayers of Boston University and John Luke of HTG, and then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we'll answer them today. And now over to Dr. Myers. My name is Richard Myers and I'm the director of the Genome Science Institute at the Boston University School of Medicine. Today I'm going to talk about a series of studies that my group has been doing in microRNAs in neurodegenerative disease and the implications that these studies have for using microRNAs as biomarkers for a number of different neurodegenerative diseases, but focusing primarily on Huntington's disease. To give you an outline for the structure of my talk, I'm going to be describing some background and rationale for studying Huntington's disease and the preliminary studies that we've done in postmortem brain tissues that support the potential for microRNAs. We've also studied microRNAs in CSF and in other neurodegenerative diseases. To give you a little background on Huntington's disease and why we chose to study it, I'm going to describe some of the salient features of it. It's an inherited neurodegenerative disease with full penetrance. Essentially, everyone who inherits the gene develops the illness if they don't die of other causes prior to onset. It's a relatively rare disorder, and it has a midlife onset, averaging age 40, but the range in ages of onset is very wide and can occur at essentially any age. It's always terminal and extremely debilitating. Currently, there are no effective treatments. In this slide, I'm depicting the wide range in age of onset that is seen in Huntington disease. Most studies support the view that genetic mechanisms are the determining factors for the differing ages of onset for this disease. The gene for Huntington's disease was identified in 1993, and the title of this manuscript published in Cell describes many of the salient aspects of the gene. A novel gene containing a trinucleotide repeat that is expanded and unstable on Huntington disease chromosomes. Pages 4 and 5 of the manuscript present the entire coding region of the Huntington disease gene. It's a large gene consisting of 67 exons and spans about 171 kilobases. The trinucleotide repeat that is expanded in this gene is located in exon 1 and is depicted in the box in this figure. Here we're zooming in on the trinucleotide repeat that is located in exon 1 in the Huntington gene. CAG, 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 or cytosine, adenine, guanine, is repeated in this region of the gene. If you count the number of repeats here, you find 21 of them, which is the normal version of the gene. There is a trinucleotide repeat that occurs normally in this gene and usually centers around 17 to 20 repeats. Here we see the expansion that occurs for individuals who are destined to develop Huntington's disease. It's an approximate doubling in the size of the trinucleotide repeat from 20 to 40 or more repetitions of the trinucleotide. Because the trinucleotide repeat is located within the coding region of exon 1 of the Huntington gene, the repeat is translated into the protein. The CAG codes for the amino acid glutamine represented by the letter Q. In some instances, 
this mutation is termed a trinucleotide repeat when describing the variation in the DNA and alternatively described as a polyglutamine or poly-Q repeat when describing the consequences to the expanded repeat in the protein. The protein is thought to be the molecule that causes the neurodegenerative effects in Huntington's disease. In this slide, we observe the range of repeats that occur on both normal and expanded Huntington disease chromosomes. In the normal range, we observe repeats as small as 8 units up to 27 units. And this is defined by the observation that none of these individuals will develop Huntington's disease, nor will their children. For those individuals with repeats of 40 units or larger, everyone is considered to develop Huntington disease. In this range, the repeat is fully penetrant and assuming that the individual lives to the age at which he or she would develop symptoms, the gene is fully penetrant and all will develop the disease. There are a couple of other really important points to see in this slide. First of all, not everyone who has an expanded repeat has the same repeat size. The range of expanded repeats that result in Huntington disease depicted here is between 40 and 80 repeats. There are individuals who have been observed to have as many as 120 or more repeats. And there is a relationship between the age at onset and the number of trinucleotide repeats that the individual carries. That information I'm going to present on the next slide. But before we get to that one, I want to show you two other repeat ranges that are observed in Huntington's disease. The first one is between 27 and 35 units. In this range, men who carry these repeats can transmit a repeat that is larger than their own. And even though these parents, these fathers, do not themselves develop Huntington's disease, occasionally, on rare occasions, the children of these men can inherit a repeat in the range of 40 or larger and actually manifest, manifest Huntington's disease. When this occurs, the gene then acts just as any other expanded repeat would for Huntington disease and can be transmitted to the offspring in an autosomal dominant fashion. In addition to that repeat size, there's also a repeat size between 36 and 39 units. In this range, the gene is of reduced penetrance. Some of these individuals will develop Huntington's disease and some of them will not. There are not a lot of observations and so it's difficult to define the exact percent of individuals who would develop disease, but as the repeat approaches 40, the penetrance increases and a larger proportion of individuals will develop Huntington's disease. In this slide, I want to show you the relationship between the size of the CAG repeat and the age at onset for the individual. The x-axis shows the age of onset and the y-axis the HD repeat size. You can see that for individuals with 60 or more repeats, the majority of them will manifest Huntington's disease before the age of 20. Individuals with much smaller repeats for example, in the low 40s or even less than 40, the age of onset is often older than the age of 60. There's a very wide range in age of onset, but the specificity of onset age for a given repeat size is not precise. For example, take the common repeat size of 45. Individuals can begin to show symptoms as young as the age of 20, and as old as the age of 50. Consequently, the repeat size is only a modest predictor of the age of onset for a given individual because it can vary by as much as 30 years for that repeat size. Nonetheless, it's possible to estimate the age of onset for a given individual based upon the repeat size, and there are several algorithms that are used to do so. 
Some of those we'll describe later in this presentation. But realize that that estimation is fairly crude and that there are many variations that occur from the estimated age of onset for given individuals. It's important to give you the rationale for why we chose to study Huntington's disease in the first place. In one respect, Huntington disease is a lot like a lot of other neurodegenerative diseases. It is a protein aggregation disorder, much like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and several other neurodegenerative diseases, misfolded and aggregated proteins are a hallmark of Huntington's disease. Consequently, the patterns that we see in Huntington's disease might be representative of patterns that we see in other diseases. The most important thing that makes Huntington's disease an easy model for studying neurodegenerative diseases is that everyone with this disease has the same genetic defect a CAG trinucleotide repeat expansion. In contrast, both Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and other diseases have a multitude of different etiological factors that contribute to the manifestation of those diseases. A very large number of genes are implicated in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, for example, and several dozen different etiological factors are likely to be responsible for individuals who manifest those diseases. Thus, in Huntington disease, we're studying a much more homogeneous disorder. There's a final factor that makes Huntington disease particularly interesting to study, and that is because the gene has been identified and genetic testing is available, it's possible to identify those individuals who carry the disorder but who do not yet manifest symptoms. Consequently, we can study those individuals who are destined to develop the disease long before the disease is actually manifest. My lab has performed a number of RNA sequencing studies in postmortem brain samples derived from both Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. These include both large RNA sequencing and small RNA sequencing studies. All of these data are available through the GEO database. A number of these studies led us to believe that microRNAs might be good candidates for biomarkers in neurodegenerative diseases. I'm going to describe some of the rationale behind why we think this is true. MicroRNAs are really interesting small RNA molecules. This figure depicts some of the important processes that occur for microRNAs. First, they're transcribed from DNA in the nucleus, and they form a larger molecule which has to be processed in two steps. The first step is a Drosha enzyme that cleaves the molecule to a hairpin. Then this hairpin molecule is exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where it's again processed by a different enzyme called Dicer to form a single strand of RNA that's usually about 22 nucleotides in length. The 22 nucleotide length strand of microRNA is important for the RNA-induced silencing complex. This silencing complex is critical in that it attaches to the three prime untranslated region of a messenger RNA and targets that message for degradation and inhibits its translation into a protein. Consequently, microRNAs are important in processing messenger RNAs for degradation and determining which messenger RNAs will be uh, permitted to be translated into protein and which of them will be targeted for destruction. There are a number of important features about microRNAs that make them really good candidates for biomarkers. First of all, microRNAs are very stable. Unlike other RNA molecules that are labile and easily broken down by RNases, microRNAs are not susceptible to this degradation process. We've had samples of plasma that we've kept at room temperature for over 24 hours, and the levels of microRNAs have not changed appreciably. 
The second thing that's important to note in microRNAs is that they respond relatively quickly to the intracellular environment. For example, cells that are under stress will express different numbers and quantities of microRNAs than those cells that are unstressed. Consequently, the microRNAs can represent changes in the cellular conditions that are undergoing challenge in the context of neurodegeneration. These features make microRNAs important for detecting changes that occur as cells are experiencing the stresses that occur in the context of neurodegeneration. As I mentioned earlier, our initial studies of microRNAs were done in postmortem brain samples from Huntington, Parkinson, and control samples. The region of the brain that we chose to study for all of these sequencing studies is the Brodmann area 9, which is located in the prefrontal cortex depicted here. The reason we selected Brodmann 9 is because it's a region that does manifest the protein aggregation that observed in neurons in both Huntington disease and Parkinson disease, but the amount of neurodegeneration that occurs in this region is relatively mild relative to other areas. We felt that this was important because otherwise the classes of microRNAs or messenger RNAs that we were studying would be representative of different cellular subtypes. For example, if all the neurons had died in the region that we were studying, such as would be the case in the striatum in Huntington disease, then we would be left with only glial cells from which to extract microRNAs. Alternatively, in the Brodmann area 9, the proportions of neurons and glia in Huntington disease brain and normal brain are relatively similar. The same observation is present for Parkinson disease, where the proportions of neurons and glial cells are relatively similar between Parkinson and controlled brain samples. We published our findings for microRNAs in Huntington disease brains in BMC Medical Genomics, and this is the paper that describes the relationship of microRNAs to the age at onset and the extent of neurodegeneration. All of these data, as I mentioned previously, are available in GEO, and the accession number is presented here. The numbers of brain samples that we studied included 36 controls and 26 individuals dying with Huntington disease. Two individuals who were known to be gene carriers for the Huntington gene but dying of other causes prior to the age of onset are also studied. The average age of death is similar across these three groups and the RNA integrity numbers are also similar and relatively high for postmortem brain averaging around 7.3 to 7.7. The relationship between the levels of certain microRNAs and the amount of neurodegeneration occurring in Huntington's disease is surprisingly strong. I want to make a couple of points here that are really important. These three figures are depicting the amount of neurodegeneration that occurs in the striatum in Huntington's disease. The striatum is the region that is primarily targeted in neurodegeneration in Huntington's disease. But remember, the region from which we took sample was for the prefrontal cortex. So what we see here is that measurements done in the prefrontal cortex are strongly related to the effects of the disease that are represented in the striatum. In this figure, I'm presenting three different analyses of the relationship of the microRNA MER10B 5P to the amount of neurodegeneration that occurs in the Huntington brain. Starting with the figure on the left, on the x-axis, we see on the far left controls, followed by the grade zero cases. These are the individuals who were asymptomatic at the time that they were studied, but were known to be Huntington gene carriers. Then we have a grade two, which is modest involvement, a grade three, which is moderate involvement, and grade four, which is severe involvement in the striatum.
we see an almost linear relationship between the amount of microRNA expressed in that brain to the amount of neurodegeneration. The two figures on the right represent a striatal score, which is a more continuous measure of the same thing. Here we're depicting only the individuals who actually have Huntington disease, and the relationship of those individuals and the amount of neurodegeneration that occurs and the correlation to the levels of microRNA Mertin B5P. R square is equal to 0.6 in this middle figure, and even after adjusting for the effects of the age of onset, we have a significant relationship between the CAG repeat adjusted striatal score and the level of the Mertin B microRNA. Not only did we see a relationship to the amount of neurodegeneration, we also saw a strong linear relationship with the age at onset of the individual. Again, here in this slide, we're looking at those individuals who actually manifest Huntington disease and the relationship of the level of Mertin B5P to age at onset. Individuals with very high levels of Mertin B5P had younger ages of onset than those who had lower levels of Mertin B5P even after adjusting for the effects of the CAG repeat size. The level of Mertin B, 5P, is strongly associated with the observed age of onset in the individuals who already have Huntington's disease. Notably, the microRNAs with the strongest relationship to age at onset and the level of neurodegeneration seen in Huntington disease were all located in Hox clusters. The Mertin B5P microRNA that I just described is located in the Hox D cluster on chromosome 2, Q31.1. Our studies of messenger RNAs also noted that a number of Hox genes are upregulated in Huntington disease brain above that seen in normal adult brain. While we don't completely understand why the Hox genes are susceptible to upregulation in the adult Huntington brain, one thing is clear. The microRNAs are strongly associated with important clinical features in Huntington's disease, and the increases in these levels of microRNAs are strongly correlated with age at onset and the amount of neurodegeneration that is occurring within the brain. For these reasons, we felt that microRNAs might be windows into what's happening within the brain for individuals who carry the Huntington disease gene, and that it may be possible, by studying the levels of microRNAs, to develop biomarkers that will tell us which individuals are beginning to show neurodegenerative effects of the Huntington gene, perhaps as much as 10, 20, or 30 years prior to the onset of symptoms. These would be very important in developing clinical trials for people who don't yet manifest Huntington's disease. Late last year, we published a study assessing the utility of microRNAs in cerebrospinal fluid as biomarkers for Huntington disease in individuals who did not yet manifest clinical symptoms of the disease. In all, we studied 60 cerebral spinal fluid samples. In this study, we used the HTG microRNA assay protocol to measure the levels of microRNAs in the cerebral spinal fluid. We used the HTG protocol for several reasons, first being that there's not a lot of RNA that can be extracted from cerebral spinal fluid and the HDG protocol is adept at detecting small levels of RNA. Specifically, we were able to do our study using only 15 microliters of cerebrospinal fluid from each individual. Furthermore, the HDG protocol detects the levels of more than 2,000 individual microRNAs. This is considerably more than any other available platform that we could identify at the time. Of the 60 cerebrospinal fluid samples that we studied, 15 of them were from controls who did not carry an expanded trinucleotide repeat. 30 were from individuals 
who were gene carriers for the Huntington disease trinucleotide repeat expansion, but who were not yet symptomatic. These are termed prodromal Huntington disease, and they're divided into three different categories. The first category being 10 individuals who are at low risk for immediately developing Huntington's disease. Their mean age was 31 years. The second group were 10 individuals who were at medium risk for immediate diagnosis of Huntington disease, and their mean age was around 39 years of age. The third group was a high risk for immediate diagnosis of Huntington disease, and their mean age was 51 years. These three groups are divided into approximately 10 year increments approaching the age of onset of Huntington disease. The final group were 15 individuals who were already HD diagnosed. The mean age of this group is around 56 years of age. In this slide, I'm showing you the relationship of the levels of six different microRNAs in relationship to the clinical state of the individuals. In the upper left-hand corner, the microRNA MER520F3P shows a relationship where increasing level of microRNA is seen even in those individuals who are the furthest from their expected age of onset, the individuals with a mean age of around 30 years are increased over those of controls. The next group, the mid-group, those individuals with a mean age close to 40 have an even higher level, at which point the level of microRNA appears to level off and to be approximately equal among those with high risk for immediate diagnosis and those individuals who are already diagnosed with Huntington disease. A similar pattern is seen for the other five microRNAs, where the individuals with low risk are increased above those seen in the controls and increases further to those in the middle range and levels off for the high and the HD affected groups. What's important here is that we detect differences that are seen in Huntington disease gene carriers as many as 30 years prior to their expected age of onset. This allows us to identify changes in the levels of microRNAs in cerebrospinal fluid for persons who do not yet show symptoms of Huntington's disease, and that these changes may be reflective of alternative modifications to the cellular integrity of neurons and other cell types in the brain of these individuals. This is evidence that microRNAs may be important biomarkers that could be used in clinical trials for individuals who do not yet show symptoms of Huntington's disease. If the therapeutic in question returns the level of the microRNA to one that more nearly matches the control sample, that may be evident that that therapeutic intervention is actually reversing the effect of the protein aggregation that occurs in the brain of individuals who are Huntington disease gene carriers. This is evidence that microRNAs may be my biomarkers that can be used in those kinds of clinical trials. There are a large number of clinical trials that are in varying stages for Huntington's disease. Essentially all of these trials are ongoing among individuals who are currently symptomatic for the disease as there are no yet identified biomarkers that can be used in the clinical trials for individuals who do not yet show symptoms. Consequently, clinical trials in the prodromal phase of the disease has not been possible until now. As I mentioned earlier, we feel that Huntington disease is an ideal model for other neurodegenerative diseases and that microRNAs may be useful for clinical trials in other disorders. This opens the opportunity for a new realm of preventive medicine in neurological diseases. Obviously, preventive medicine approaches 
in the context of cardiovascular disease have been present for many years. Antihypertensives lower the levels of blood pressure. Statins lower the levels of cholesterol. And both of these interventions reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease. Similar kinds of interventions, however, have not been possible in neurological diseases. We believe that the study of microRNAs may open the door to performing similar preventive medicine in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. In the context of diseases such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, where there are many different etiological factors that lead to the manifestation of these diseases, we may expect to find a variety of different profiles that are predictive of the progression and expression of AD and PD. Specifically, different individuals with Parkinson's disease diagnoses may have different causes and the microRNA profiles that are represented by these different causes might be informative for whether or not that individual will be responsive to a specific therapeutic intervention. By studying large samples of Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease individuals, it may be possible to identify clusters of profiles of microRNAs that are specific to certain etiological sources of these diseases. While genetic testing for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease is not feasible, one could imagine a scenario where individuals who have a family history of either Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease might undergo a lumbar puncture to obtain a profile of microRNAs that would be indicative of whether or not certain therapeutic interventions could be brought to bear prior to the onset of their disease. These therapeutic interventions could postpone the onset of these very debilitating neurodegenerative diseases. Finally, it's important to recognize and acknowledge that the cerebrospinal fluid samples that were studied here are derived from the PREDICT HD study, which is run by Dr. Jane Paulson at the University of Iowa. I'd also like to acknowledge many members of my group, specifically Eric Reed and Jean Latterell, who were instrumental in performing the CSF studies that I described, and that the Jerry McDonald Huntington Disease Research Fund sponsored all of the analyses of microRNAs in cerebrospinal fluid that were performed in these studies. Now I'm going to turn the microphone over to my colleagues at HTG so that they can describe some of the specific characteristics of the assays that I used in my studies. Thank you. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Myers again for his wonderful presentation. It's really, really exciting to see how HTGNC technology is being used in a novel way with some pretty unusual sample types to create some uh, really interesting results. Um, and just like to thank, again thank you for his time and his effort and presenting for us today. Um, very briefly, just to introduce you to HDG, if you're not familiar with us, um, our mission statement is to empower precision medicine at the local level. Uh, and to that end, we work with researchers from both translational research all the way up to the clinic uh, to look at both research questions and then uh, de deploy those as clinical diagnostics. Um, we have a combo of uh, instruments and reagents that we use, uh, including both microRNA and mRNA assays to achieve this. And the common theme that you think you'll see and the common benefit that you'll see from using HTG Edge Seek technology is that you're able to obtain a lot of data uh, from a very small sample. As Dr. Myers mentioned in his presentation, uh, 15 microliters of cerebral spinal fluid is sufficient to power the HTG miRNA whole transcriptome assay. Uh, the small sample input requirements uh, extends to other sample types, including FFPE tissue where a single section of material is normally required. Uh, cell lines or plasma and serum, where again, 15 microliters of material is, is more than sufficient to power the assay. The assay has also been validated for work with PAX gene and extracted RNA. Now I'll briefly describe the HTG EDC chemistry. We first start with a nuclease protection probe shown here in orange. In the case for microRNA assays, these are essentially the reverse complements of the microRNAs that we want to target. For our, the mRNA assays, this orange sequence is approx approximately 50 bases in length. Regardless of the probe sequence contained in the orange portion of the probe, we place two universal wings shown here in gray on either side of that protection probe. 
You then hybridize those two wing sequences to wingmen, which are small uh, DNA oligonucleotides themselves, which creates a double strand of uh, wing structure but a single strand of protection probe. This probe structure is then cocktailed up up to 2,560 uh, probes per assay, and then we can hybridize this to the mRNA or microRNA in, contained within the lysates. Those probes are added in tremendous excess so that only the probes which find an appropriate microRNA or mRNA uh, molecule hybridize to them, and we then add S1 nuclease. S1 nuclease will remove any single-stranded nucleic acid contained within the lysate and, re and, and most importantly, removes all of the uh, un un hybridized uh, nucleus protection probes. So that at the end of the process, we have a set of DNA uh, uh, nucleus protection probes that are there at a one-to-one -one ratio as our starting mRNA or microRNAs. We then take this library of DNA probes and then use a very simple process to add both adapters and tag sequences that allow molecular barcoding appropriate for either the Illumina or the ion torrent sequencers. After a quick cleanup, we have a double-stranded DNA st uh, structure that is then able to go straight into the standard uh, next-generation sequencing uh, protocol used by either Illumina or ion torrent sequencers. As previously mentioned, the HTG edge seq chemistry is, is compatible with both Illumina and ion torrent sequencers. And to that end, we have specialized adapters with relevant barcode sequences for both of those families of sequencing instruments. Uh, this allows us to leverage the NGS instrumentation that you have already in your lab to minimize the uh, adoption costs and capital outlays required to bring our technology on board. We also offer flexible kit configurations to optimize the level of samples which can be multiplexed across each of the sequencers. HTG offers a number of off-the-shelf research use only products which can be rapidly applied to a number of different research areas. Uh, for the field of immuno-oncology, we offer an immuno-oncology panel as well as a soon-to-be-released HDG EdgeSeq Precision Immuno-Oncology Panel, which has up almost 1,400 uh, immuno-oncology-related genes. Uh, to look at the tumor biology, we offer the HDG EdgeSeq Oncology Biomarker Panel with approximately 2,560 oncology-related genes. For more specialized uh, applications in lymphoma research, we offer the HDG EdgeSeq DLBCL Panel. Uh, as well as our HDG EdgeSeq PATH assay, which has uh, complements, gene complements for a number of different IHC markers that are uh, commonly used in research today. There are two easy ways to start working in the HDG EdgeSeq chemistry. The first is through our Vario service laboratory, where our dedicated team of, of scientists will establish an SOW and, sample, uh, and process your samples as a service. The second is to work with HDG and acquire the HDG EdgeSeq instrumentation and order the reagents and kits. We also have relationships with a number of academic core laboratories that might also be uh, local to you and, and could serve as a, a place for you to run your samples. For further information about uh, our working with HG or any of our products in general, feel free to contact the email address below or please get more information at the uh, website www.hgmolecular.com. I'd just like to wrap up by thanking you uh, for your time and attention today and thanking Dr. Myers again for his wonderful presentation. And now we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations, John and Richard. It is now time for the Q&A with the speakers. Uh, to ask a question, all you have to do is type it in where it says ask your question and then press submit. So our first question uh, and this one is for you, Richard. Uh, it asks, um, is there any association between plasma uh, microRNA level and clinical symptoms of uh, HD? That's a good question. So we did a study on microRNAs in plasma in Huntington's disease, and we actually published that in a journal called Movement Disorders, um, maybe about a year and a half ago. I don't have the exact date in front of me. And what we found was that microRNAs were elevated in plasma, but that they didn't change over the course of the disease, nor were they different among individuals who were gene carriers and presymptomatic. So basically what we see is sort of a, a flat increased level of microRNAs among individuals who are gene carriers as well as among individuals who are already affected, uh, but that these aren't responsive to the clinical features that we studied here in, um, in CSF. Uh, 
that that sort of led us to believe that maybe there are effects that are going on systemically in Huntington disease that might be modifying plasma levels, but they don't do a good job of reflecting what's going on in the central nervous system. And it was really as a consequence of that that we decided that we would go to CSF and that there would be perhaps, and as we as we saw, uh, greater correspondence between clinical state and CSF than what we saw in plasma. Great. Thanks, Richard. And our next question asks, um, you uh, mentioned preventative medicine um, in your learning outcomes uh, for the webcast. Um, right. Could you um, expand upon, upon what you sort of mean by that? Sure. I think in the long run, what we'd like to do is try to postpone neurodegenerative disease and offer individuals who are destined to develop a disease like Huntington's disease or Parkinson or Alzheimer some mechanism to postpone the age at which they will start to develop symptoms. So these are strategies that, as I mentioned in the talk, that are used commonly in cardiovascular disease. So, so there are ways with antihypertensives to lower blood pressure that will uh, prevent or uh, reduce the risk for developing either heart disease or stroke, and the same is true for statins that lower cholesterol levels, that they will reduce the risk for having a heart attack. But we don't have that in neurological disease. And I, I think that there, it's credible that people who have a family history of either Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, that they have firsthand knowledge of what it's like to have an illness like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease if they have a parent or another close relative with it. And that while people might find having a lumbar puncture something that um, you wouldn't necessarily want to have, but if you had the opportunity to postpone your Alzheimer's disease, your Parkinson's disease, Huntington disease, et cetera, then the lumbar puncture could tell you whether or not taking a particular therapeutic that could postpone the disease would be worthwhile. Um, and in fact, you know, there are other things that people do that aren't so unusual. For example, colonoscopies are much more invasive than lumbar punctures. And uh, and clearly lots of people want to postpone or prevent colon cancer. And if you could do the same thing for Alzheimer's or Parkinson, then that level of preventive medicine would be tremendously important, would allow people to live longer, healthier lives and be more productive members of our society. Great. Thanks, Richard. And our next question asks, um, how do uh, microRNAs influence uh, HD uh, pathogenesis? Pathogenesis. So, so I think the question is asking um, whether or not the microRNAs are actually contributing to the neurodegeneration that occurs in Huntington disease. In other words, might they be causal factors that uh, promote the way the nerve cells are dying in the brain in Huntington disease? And my current view is that they are not actually causing or contributing to the pathogenesis, but they are responding to it. So uh, I think what happens is that the, the things that is causing the neurodegeneration is actually the accumulation of the misfolded protein. And that as that misfolded protein accumulates within the brain cell, the the cell is responding to that stress by altering the way that different genes are expressed. And the alterations of the genes that are expressed in response to degeneration are regulated by microRNAs. And so as the as the neuron and other cells are, are experiencing increasing levels of stress as they're approaching cell death, for example, then the levels of the microRNAs are responding with, with greater and greater levels uh, in, in response to that stress. So I, I, I view the microRNA as not um, causing it, but 
giving us insight into the level of stress that is occurring within that brain, sort of a window into the brain of how stressed that individual is in the brain. And and that's what we see among people who are pre-symptomatic, don't show symptoms yet. You know, the levels of the microRNAs are above normal, but they're not as high as what we see in the people who are already affected. And they increase as we approach the age of onset of the disease. Great. Thanks, Richard. And just a quick reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask uh, Richard and John uh, your questions. All you have to do is type it in where it says to ask your question mm -hmm. and then press submit. Um, Richard, our next question uh, asks, um, what are your thoughts about collecting uh, CSF for the purpose of biomarker detection right. for new red degenerative diseases, um, can lumbar puncture be avoided um, and analyzed sort of via peripheral blood instead? Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this in a couple of ways. Um, when we tried to study blood, the relationship of the microRNAs to the clinical features just wasn't strong enough in our study. Now, it could be, I'm not going to say that it's impossible or that we won't develop technology or insights that go beyond what we have today that might not turn out to be effective in, in blood, in plasma or serum, for example. But um, with the technologies that we have available to, our, to, to us right now, the blood samples just didn't yield the level of predictive power that we found from the cerebral spinal fluid. And in relationship to that, I, I, I want to speak a little bit to um, what kinds of clinical trials are going on and why we think doing a lumbar puncture might not turn out to be uh, so unusual. So there are certain gene-modifying therapeutic trials that are currently being um, used in Huntington disease. Specifically, these are antisense oligonucleotides that are literally injected into the spinal cord, the spinal fluid, and um, with some positive pressure sent into the brain. And these antisense oligonucleotides then attach to the Huntington gene and they prevent the gene from being translated into the toxic protein. In the context of doing that kind of clinical trial into the spinal cord, the first thing that's done is to actually remove some spinal fluid. And the reason that spinal fluid is removed is because they're going to inject the treatment into the spinal fluid, and you don't want to create pressure on the brain, which would be sort of analogous to hydrocephalus. So some spinal fluid is removed, and then the antisense oligonucleotide is injected into the spinal fluid, in, and it travels into the brain. So there will be spinal fluid available in those clinical trials where one could measure microRNAs to see whether or not that antisense oligonucleotide is actually succeeding in returning the levels of the microRNAs to more normal levels. So these are gene-modifying or gene transcription-modifying therapeutics that are already in clinical trial in Huntington disease and that utilize cerebrospinal fluid uh, as, a, as the mechanism to reach into the brain. Um, and, and I think that makes it relevant to the study of CSF for biomarkers in Huntington disease. Similar trials are already being talked about and planned in Parkinson's disease, ALS. Now, there are a number of other contexts where these kinds of antisense oligonucleotides are, are viable candidates for therapeutics in neurodegenerative disease. Great. Thanks, Richard. And our next question uh, asks, um, what do you think about the role of microRNAs um, in different manifestations of clinical symptoms. Uh, so, for uh -huh. example, if two patients with the same number of repetitions, uh, but the but they have manifestations of symptoms that are different. 
Right. Uh, I think there are a few things here that are that are relevant to Huntington's disease, actually. Um, one is, you know, we actually see fairly wide variation in clinical manifestation in Huntington disease. Some people have a lot of cognitive impairment. They have some real serious memory loss, and then other people don't. Um, there are also individuals who have a fair amount of serious depression that can occur in Huntington disease, while other people don't. And and then the, even the amount of movement disorder that we see in Huntington disease, which is the most common symptom that people think of in Huntington disease, is sort of an involuntary choreic dance-like movement disorder, that can vary fairly substantially from one individual to the next as well. And I think the, the question that's posed here is really important because I think it's very credible that we would see slightly different profiles of microRNAs that would be related to whether or not this is an individual who has perhaps a lot of psychiatric difficulty relative to somebody who has a lot more movement disorder and relative to somebody who might have more cognitive impairment. And part of what is seen in the imaging studies in Huntington disease is that different individuals experience a lot of cortical involvement. Some people have a lot of cortical involvement and other people don't. And then there, there can also be a range of involvement in the striatum where there's a lot of striatal involvement that's very aggressive in the striatum and other people seem to have sort of a milder striatal involvement. And I think it's credible to think that we would have different profiles that might be seen in the microRNAs relative to these different clinical manifestations. But I have to admit that the size of our particular study didn't allow us to ask those questions. And I think one of the things we'd really like to be able to do is to increase the size of our study to, you know, instead of 60, but maybe three, four, five times that many. You know, it would be really lovely to study 200 people or 200 CSF samples in Huntington disease. And, and I think our data would suggest that would be important to more precisely predict exactly what's going on in the brain in Huntington disease. Thanks, Richard. And our next question asks, um, what do you see as the next critical steps for developing uh, microRNAs as biomarkers for Huntington? Right. Yeah, I sort of just alluded to that, in fact. The specific study that we did here identifies six microRNAs that are uh, really strong candidates for biomarkers in Huntington disease. But I think we need to be careful that these data that are generated in the study I just described might be fit to the specific sample that that we studied. And it could be that one or another of the microRNAs that didn't quite reach statistical significance in our first study might turn out to be similarly predictive in a, in a larger data set. And so I think the very first thing that we need to do is to increase the sample size again and um, and that that would give us greater precision in exactly which microRNAs are the most predictive of, of Huntington disease, neurodegeneration, or other clinical features. And sort of what's the minimum set of microRNAs that need to be measured to get a profile of what's happening for each individual. Among the microRNAs that we published, the levels of these microRNAs are, are correlated with one another, the ones that are increased in, in uh, Huntington disease presymptomatically in the prodromal phrase. And so maybe all of them aren't really needed. Maybe two or three of them are needed, but not all six. Or maybe there's another one that that would show up in a larger sample, as I mentioned, that would be more precise than the ones that we reported specifically. So, so there, there are definitely some things that need to be done there. And, and the second thing that I think is important is um, there could be microRNAs that, that are, are uh, at lower levels than the ones that we detected here. And those could be important as well, some that are rare, rarely transcribed to microRNA. So there's additional work that I wanna do to test out the sensitivity of the different microRNAs that we measure. And that's also similarly valuable to perfecting using these as biomarkers.
Thanks, Richard. And our next question asks, um, you mentioned Parkinson's disease and um, also Alzheimer's disease earlier. Uh, have you already studied CSF for these two diseases? Uh, and if yeah. so, what did you find? Um, for example, are the same microRNAs implicated or are they different for these um, other diseases? Right, yeah. Um, so we have studied Parkinson's disease, CSF, and the data that we've been studying actually was generated by a group in Arizona. So it wasn't, these are not assays that were done in my lab. Although, ironically, um, and what's valuable here is that the brain samples studied in, in, uh, in my lab are from the same individuals for whom CSF was studied in the other lab um, in Arizona. So these are samples that come from the Banner Sun Health Brain Bank, and at the time of death for the individuals who had Parkinson's disease and the control individuals, they collected CSF at the time of death, as well as then the postmortem brain sample. And and some years ago, I had been working with this group for a while, Tom Beach and the group at Banner Sum Health, and, um, and we had been studying microRNAs in the Parkinson disease postmortem brain, and then and then uh, the other group did the CSF. So we do see this correspondence between what's going on in the brain and what's going on in the CSF and Parkinson disease, similar to what we saw in Huntington disease, as I described here. And um, and so even though that correspondence, even though we haven't published those data, uh, they they generate some similar findings, some similar optimism that we have for the use of microRNAs in, in Parkinson's disease. Now, I will say that I've not studied Alzheimer's disease at all, and I don't have Alzheimer's disease brains or CSF in my lab, and we sort of decided we can't do everything, but we have focused a lot on Parkinson and Huntington disease. In the context of whether or not we see the same microRNAs or different microRNAs, we see actually a whole different class of microRNAs that show up in Parkinson's disease than those that show up in Huntington disease. And so what we can say right now is that these are disease-specific modifications that occur in Huntington relative to Parkinson. And I would assume the same would be seen in Alzheimer from what I can make out from literature uh, of folks who are looking at microRNAs in Alzheimer, then there are another set that are altered in Alzheimer. The other thing that I mentioned in my talk that is important to understand in Parkinson disease, though, is that there are a multitude of different genes that are implicated in Parkinson's disease. You know, eight or ten different monogenic forms, and then, you know, 27 or 30 different genetic loci identified by genome-wide association studies that are implicated in Parkinson's disease that modify risk for developing Parkinson's disease. So different people carry different genetic etiologies, and then there are a group of people with Parkinson's disease who don't seem to carry any of those genetic risk factors, and it's less clear why they develop Parkinson's disease, but obviously they do. And so it is my expectation, and I think most people in the field expect that there will be different profiles of microRNAs that can be used to identify different clinical and genetic subsets of Parkinson's disease, and the same would be true in Alzheimer's disease, and that that would be especially important because then these different subsets can be studied in therapeutic clinical trials to see if certain subsets are responding to therapy while other subsets don't. And by subdividing the disease into these different groups, I think the clinical trials would become much more powerful in identifying the therapeutics that are actually effective in Parkinson's disease. And it would be useful, maybe not in everybody, but in you know, a subset, say 20, 25, 40% of Parkinson's disease might respond. But if you're trying to include everybody who has Parkinson's disease, then that subset might not be powerful enough to show that that therapeutic is actually effective in a subgroup of, of that disease. So uh, a lot of work that can be done in these other diseases in the context of microRNA biomarkers. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. 
I would like to thank uh, today's speakers, Dr. Richard Myers and John Luke, and the webcast sponsors, HTG, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand by visiting nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.